ZBrush is awesome, but it does have a lot of things that are hidden and a lot of workflows that people don't really know about. And so I thought I would put all of the pro tips that I use in every single one of my projects and the things I think everybody that uses ZBrush should know all into one video. So if you're getting started using ZBrush or if you've been using it for a really long time, there's probably something in here that you didn't know. So let's jump into it right now. Okay, tip number one. I think this is the most important tip. So if you're not familiar with this, this is the one takeaway that I think is really key and that's projecting. So in ZBrush, if we come down in here, we can see something called project. Let's say you have a model like this one. This model is a Dynamesh. So it's got really messed up topology. You've just been sketching on it, not worrying about topology, which is great. You can get messed up junky meshes a million different ways. And this is why this is so important. So if you have a messed up mesh like this, where it's the shape that you like, it's the sculpt, you know, it's not the topology. We can put better topology on it. So I'll show you that right now. So you can see with the base mesh, I've got nice clean topology, right? So in this case, I want to wrap this topology onto that new shape. So I want all the subdivision levels. I want the nice topology of this mesh, but I want to look like the other one. So for this, I'll just rip off this stuff. There we go. So we have this. So now if the only two things I have in my subtool palette are the things that I want to project, the source, and then the thing that I want to be projected onto it. There are two meshes visible now. It'll just project everything that's visible. So if I come down here to project, I want blur off. Looks like it's off now. Great. Distance mean you can leave this right now. And you can also project color if you wanted to. So if the mesh had poly paint or something, vertex colors, you could project that too. Let's just hit project all right now. There you go. So now it kind of looks like it, right? But a couple problems. You can see the mouth is shooting through it. That's because the border edges of the mouth are just like projecting super through because the junkie mesh doesn't have an open mouth like this. And then the other problem is that we don't have enough resolution here to even capture the detail, right? So let's jump back here. We'll undo this. So in my case, what I can do is I can divide up. You can see I'm at subdivision level four right now. So let's go to six, which is pretty high. And then I'll store a morph target. I'll just make sure to isolate everything except the inner mouth. And then I can just paint a mask. So I'm gonna come in here, I'm just gonna paint a mask along the border edge. There you go. So I'm just saying, hey, don't uh, project this stuff. Now we hit project all. There you go. You can see the changes from the other mesh came through. Now we get the detail, but then we still all have these problems, right? Well, what we can do is bring the morph brush back. And then with this morph brush, I can just morph it back to the original shape just to get the parts that are problems. There you go. So now if we jump back and forth, you can see I get all the details, but I also get the nice clean topology. Now, the reason why this is super key is that I think it's an important distinction to make between shape and topology. As long as you're comfortable with this sort of stuff, then you can feel very comfortable that you can always make the kind of mesh you need and then the shape. Because when you start out, you just want to be creative. You just want to make stuff. And then also sometimes in production or even in your own projects, you realize, oh, I want to make a big change. You know, if you have a creature and you just want to have an extra set of arms, you can just jam an extra arm in there, Dynamesh, melt it all together, just play with it like clay. So then whenever you're ready for nice topology, you can duplicate that kind of clay sculpt and then work with ZRemesher and whatever you want to make nice topology, then divide that new duplicated mesh up project the details, and now you'll have a mesh that has all the exact same details and look, but with subdivision levels and with nice topology. Tip number two is scale. Scale is one of the weird, quirky things about ZBrush. And if you're not careful, you can get into a pretty messed up situation. So the scale is definitely jank in ZBrush. There's some like translating in and out. Anyways, it doesn't matter. But here, here's the thing. If you look down here in the bottom, if I go to export, you can see there's numbers in here. That's actually really important. Every one of your ZBrush files, especially if it has the correct scale, is gonna have numbers like that. So there's some operations and I don't know them specifically, but you can get into a situation where this gets zeroed out and then you are in a problem because if you export your model out and bring it into any other kind of DCC, it's gonna be really tiny. And if your scale's wrong, it can really mess up a project. It's really hard to resolve it because scale kind of has to be perfect, right? And so for me, the best practice is a, establish your scale outside of ZBrush. You start with a base mesh, start with a cube or a sphere and actually measure it so it's correct and then bring it in and then start versioning from there. So you can always roll back. You know that you have a version where everything is correct. If you do get into a weird sticky spot, there is a plugin up here called Scale Master and I have used this when I'm in a real bind. It's not gonna be perfect though, but if you're just doing things for renders and stuff, 
doing something like that can at least get you in the ballpark of a realistic scale. All right, tip number three, keep it low. I know ZBrush is great because how many polygons it can do, and that really is its special ingredient, but keeping things as low as possible while you sculpt is so huge. Like if you're sculpting like this, you wanna keep it as low as possible while you're establishing things. Size, proportion, you know, like maybe even like points of anatomy and stuff like that. And then when you feel like you've gotten the most out of this resolution that you're really limited, then you jump up. And that's really the best way to sculpt because you're limiting and making sure you're focusing on the big to small. The most common mistake in ZBrush, especially for newcomers, is to go way too high poly, way too fast, especially Dynamesh, and then they don't have any subdivision levels, and then they're just sculpting on this super dense, high poly brick of a Dynamesh, and everything is hard. And if you wanted to like just do something like this and go, you know what, I think his arms should go like this. You just can't. So in general, the best practice for sculpting anyways is to work from big to small, and really trying to get the most out of each subdivision level is a good way to ensure that you're focusing on what's important. You also want to have subdivision levels that are low enough like this. Like this is getting pretty low, right? Because then I can smooth all this out and it's super easy to do. If the mesh was really, really dense and I wanted to smooth everything out, it would be really hard and take a lot more time. So until you know exactly what you're doing, keep it low. Tip number four is reconstructing. Reconstructing is another kind of odd thing I do sometimes and I think also can like break people's brains if they don't really know what's going on here but it is pretty simple so if i show you i have subdivision levels right here right so i can step down and i can step up now let's say i deleted these now i don't have any subdivision levels oh no well here's this button reconstruct subdiv so if i click this one two three now i've jumped all the way back down and my poly groups are here and everything and i can step up so now i've got the four subdivision levels back whoa it's like reverse dividing i can do that because i know the mesh had four subdivision levels, right? Because that's how we got here. So just to show, if you had a polygon like this and it was divided, that's how it would divide. So everything would have to be perfectly divisible by four. If I divided this again, then it would divide like this. Reconstructing is just going down, but it has to have this perfect poly count so that it can divide by four. So why is this button here? Why is it useful? It is useful sometimes in cases where you need to perform actions on your mesh that need to have no subdivisions. Here's an example. So I have this character, it's got four subdivision levels, but it's got this arm that's welded, right? But maybe I don't need this torso. Like maybe, maybe he's gonna have a shirt on like this, you know? So I don't need this torso. Okay, well, let's delete like this, like this. All right, so then now I'm gonna delete hidden, doink. So now all that stuff's gone. Now I'll also, Split. Okay, so now, boom. So now I split. So now what do I have? I have the head and I have the arms as separate objects, but they don't have subdivision levels. Well, I can come over here and I can click reconstruct. And now I'm back down to all four. Same with the head. Boom, boom, boom. Now I have two sub tools and I have all the detail that I sculpted. I have the pieces that I want and I didn't lose anything. I just got to separate it. And that's because I could reconstruct because obviously I can go all the way up. I can go all the way down. Next, I wanna share a couple brush settings that I think are really useful that if you don't know about are gonna change your life, okay? Here's the first one, back face masking. Because how many times has this happened, right? You're over here, you know, you're in the zone, you're sculpting some stuff and you're like, yeah, dude, I'm doing some some cloth. Oh yeah, yeah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Got my, listening to my tunes, just chilling. But then, oh, you realize, what's this? Oh, it's been going through. That's not what we want. You can see now if I get the clay brush and I just go really hard, look at that. No. Well, you can use back face masking in brushes, auto masking, back face mask. I actually put it in my UI because I use it a lot. So now with back face mask on, that doesn't happen. I will say uh, it can cause its own problems. This isn't perfect. This isn't something you want to just leave on all the time but definitely when you're running into this exact problem, it's gonna be just on these like little nooks and crannies or things where meshes or planes are right next to each other and you just need to do a detail, then you can just check on back face mask and then turn it off whenever you're done. So really, really useful little thing if you're not aware of it already. All right, next tip, since we're on the subject of brush parameters is something that has to do with the smooth brush. If you are used to this sort of thing, check it out. I can come in here and I go, you know what? I wanna smooth all this. Well. Look what's happening. You can see here, right? This dip. We don't really want that sometimes. But what's happening is the borders are pinned. See that? 
The borders ain't going nowheres. Well, sometimes you do want the borders to go somewhere. Sometimes. So it's nice that it's on by default, but I'll show you where you can turn this off. So if we hold down shift, you can actually see, right, that it switches to the smooth brush. So actually, when I go to the brush settings, when I'm holding shift, I'm changing the smooth brush settings. Crazy. But here we go. So smooth brush, brush, smooth brush modifiers. And you'll see here, minimum connected points to smooth. Three. If we drop that down to one, now we can smooth everything. Check that out. Now we're smoothing it all. Yeah. Yeah. See, no problemo. Useful. Just that took me years to find. And every once in a while, you're going to come into a spot where you're like, man, I just want to smooth this whole thing. How come I can't smooth this whole thing? That's where that is. And next is the smooth groups brush. If you know it, you know it. And if you don't know it, your mind's gonna get blown. Here it is. So here's my character. And then let's say I'm making some cool sci-fi dude or Batman or something. It's got some organic armor on there. Super common thing to happen. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create an organic shape and then we wanna extrude it out to make some armor, right? So really common to do in ZBrush and this is how we do it. Let's make a swoopy shape. Really cool Batman-y shape, check that out. Cool, cool, cool. Cool, there we go, nice. Maybe he should be able to bend his arm a little bit. Okay, cool, there we go. So we'll come down here and we'll go to polygroups, group, masked. Now we look at our polygroups, there you go. So we're halfway there, but obviously the problem is these jagged edges. Either the resolution of the mask or the resolution of the mesh is not gonna be perfect, that's okay, because we can use the smooth groups brush. Come into Lightbox, Brush, Smooth, and Smooth Groups. So credit does go to Mike Clymer, who I initially saw this from, from a Zebra Summit in like 2017. And when he showed it, you could tell from the crowd that even though it had been around for a while, people hadn't been using it or seeing it. With Smooth Groups on there, if I paint over that group edge, yeah, that's the same reaction I got last time. So here you go. We have the Smooth Groups brush. You can see it's Smooth Groups now. So now when I hold Shift, there you go, magic happens. Turn off the line, there you go. So always super satisfying to see too. Honestly, sometimes I just invent reasons to use this because it's the most satisfying brush to use. I mean, look at the nice curvy thingies on here. Mmm, look at that. Doesn't it make you just wanna make groups and smooth them? So look at that, nice and tight. So boom, you can do this, delete hidden. And then we can do some Z remesh from here. And now because we have a perfect line, look at that topology. Perfecto. Woo. All right, so we'll set this to one, set a height and thickness, hit panel loops, doink. And then now we got a little thingy here. Then we could even do like a cool bevelly, chisely thing if we wanted to, like insert an edge loop right here, delete that one, group that, and then go crease, crease poly groups, divide up, boom, boom, boom. Look at that nice smooth thing, right? Now we could like uncrease everything, give it a little bit of a polish, boom. So there you go, there's the smooth groups brush. So awesome, fun, and satisfying to use. Like I say, I'm always just looking for an excuse to use this brush. And in this case, the excuse was this video. All right, next tip is dynamic subdiv, okay? If you're not using it, you gotta use it. I'm gonna show you some other things too that you may or may not be using. Armor, belts, everything hard surface, clothing. You know, I use this a lot. Everybody should be using this, I think, if you're making stuff inside of ZBrush. I'll show you why in a second. Let's go through just a quick scenario of making a belt. Every character has a belt, right? Every character has a million belts. Video game characters are just belts, pouches, and shoulder pads. Remember that. Okay, so here we have this character. So I'll come in here. I'll go to the curve strap flat. I'll turn off symmetry and I'll try to draw on it. Oh, look, I can't do it because it's got multiple subdivision levels. I knew that. I knew that. I just left this in here so that I could do reconstruct again for you. See, delete lower. Now I can do it, but I can always reconstruct. So we have the curved flat snap brush. I'll come over here and I'll just hold shift so that it goes all the way around. There we go. Now I don't need this curve anymore, delete. And then you can see it's unmasked. So if I split unmasked points, boom, there it goes. And then just to wrap it up, we'll go reconstruct. Look at that. Now we've got our divisions back. Okay, so we'll come over here to our belts. So cool. So now we'll just have this guy so I can turn symmetry back on, just start getting in position. But here you go. Just like cloth, the thing about belts is you need to have uniform thickness. And as with everything in 3D modeling, you want to have a pretty simple cage, a pretty simple mesh 
that's using subdivision levels like a modifier to get complicated. If you divide it up, it's kind of a destructive way to do it. But then you could, if you had thickness already, then you could drop down. But then now all of a sudden the thickness is getting messed up. So I'll show you why dynamic subdiv solves all those problems. So here we have a belt, super low poly, right? Now, just in this case, it so happens that this brush makes a mesh that has creases already. So I'll turn it off just so you can see. Uncrease all, okay. So if I go to dynamic subdiv, there you go, in the geometry palette, I'll hit dynamic and then boom. It's smooth. Now you can see we lost uh, a bunch of that thickness and we can get that back by creasing. So if I go to crease, if I hit crease PG, that's the polygroup border, this whole thing is one polygroup. So that's gonna crease the border. Crease border, boom. So now we have the right thickness. I can come back into dynamic subdiv and I can play with some settings. You can see showing me a preview of if it was subdivided twice. I can make that four. And now look, now it's like nice and smooth, right? But it doesn't stop there. There's also thickness, everybody. Thickness, okay? Use this, please. People don't use this, I don't know why. So I can make thickness come up, try to find exactly, like look, I'm actually dynamically figuring out the thickness of my belt. Isn't this better? Offsets at zero, this is pretty good. This means that, you know, if there's, um, if this is the plane of your belt looking top down, then it's gonna split the width both ways. And if you swing the offset all the way to the right, you can see, then it's popping out all the way to this way, right? You can choose what you want. I'll just leave it here for now. So now here we go, we have a belt, it's smooth, it's got thickness, and then look, I can start positioning it so fast, so easy, start to tilt the bottom so that it curves with his body. And all the while, it's this mesh, the whole time. I hit D on the keyboard, and instead of going up to subdivisions, we don't have subdivisions, so ZBrush asks, Hey, do you want to use dynamic? And yeah, I do. And then, so if I hit always yes, then as long as I'm in this session, I can use shift D to drop down and D to come up. And there you go. So then I can position it however I want and super easy. The last aspect of this and maybe the most important and why this is the way superior workflow is that I can always make edits to the mesh, which I can't do if I had subdivision level. So if I wanted to, for instance, come in here and bevel something and delete a polygon, I can still see it with dynamic. So if I crease PG, boom. So now I just made an edit to this mesh and I can easily move the mesh around and add topology. If I wanted to add more bevels, round this out. It's always this low res mesh. So we get to preview it as if it's finished while keeping it low and fully dynamic. I keep it like this for as long as possible, especially if I'm inventing things because it lets you see smoothness and thickness without committing. So you really get a good sense of what things are. But when you do want to commit, you can do that. Back over here in dynamic subdiv, you can see the apply button. Well, now it's just a mesh. But if I subdivide it, I know that it's gonna look exactly the same because we already saw that preview. Tip number nine is about Z remesh. Z Remesher is a function in ZBrush that gives you pretty good topology with the click of a button rather than having to do it by hand. So it is awesome, but it is kind of a black box in that you click a button and magic happens and then you get something back. So you do give up unlimited control, but there are some little tips you can employ to help guide Z Remesh and get something a little bit more predictable and what you need to do good looking models. So let's take a look at this mesh right here in ZBrush. We have this sculpture of a boy, which was started with DynaMesh. If we take a look at the wireframe right now, you can see it's very dense, so very high, and then not great, right? It's got these like triangle things, you know, got some intersections, and we don't have subdivision levels, the flow's not great, so it would be very difficult to turn this into a finished, polished mesh. So we want much better topology. So to do that, we can use ZRemesher. So let's do that. Before we do that though, the first step we wanna do is duplicate this mesh. This is what we have now. And now we have a duplicate. So now on this duplicate, we'll come down here into the geometry pane. See under zero mesher, we have zero mesh. And for target poly count, I have three. And you can see that means that the result would be 3000 polys. I want it to be as low as possible. And like we did at the start, we're gonna divide up and project. So let's click zero mesher right now. You can see at the top, it's gonna to start to do its magic. Okay, there we go. We have much lower topology now, right? If we jump in here, we can take a look. Okay, much lower. The flow is okay. You know, we could divide up and we might be able to get this to work. Got a problem with the nose and a common trouble area is the eyes. It's kind of pinching and we're losing the depth for the lid. So what can we do about that? Well, 
We can step it up so we'll go from 3,000 to 4,000 polygons and also we'll employ some of our little tips and tricks here to help ZRemesher give us a better mesh for what we want. First thing we'll do is we'll jump this up to four. Let's get a little bit more. Then what I'll do right now is I'll make poly groups of the different sections that I want ZRemesh to pay attention to because we can turn on this button right here, keep groups, then it's gonna try and make topology to outline those groups. So that's one of the main ways we can use to help ZRemesh know the kind of flow that we want. All right, so quickly I'll come in here and I'll just draw a mask around the eye. Okay, so we want a circle. Come in here, I'll show you with polygroups. We'll go group masked, doink. A group right there, good. I'll turn off line for now so we can just look at the sections. All right, so now we might want to put the ears on their own circle here, group masked. Hide those ears. Then we can use slice. Slice is a way that we can actually just slice up the mesh just from polygroups. And also it does add a line, it does add a cut line. So we want it to come in right here, try to get the tear duct. There we go. And then another thing we can do in addition to polygroups is you can actually just emphasize the form because Z Remesh is also looking for form changes and the more dramatic the change, the more likely it's gonna try to put some topology there to preserve the line, right? So you could just like slice right down the middle with the slice brush. You also do something like get damn standard and then rather than drawing in lines like that, you could hold alt so that it pulls up and then I'm gonna pull a sharp line down the middle where this topology might go. Same with the nostrils. By trying to emphasize that this is a border here, it's more likely that we'll get topology here and you'll see in a second why this can be useful. So now we have this stuff. Before we run it, you can see we got jaggy lines because we use group mast. Well, we can still go back to our handy smooth groups brush. See, always looking for an excuse. Anything that you actually slice is gonna be perfectly straight, but anything that you do from a mask it's gonna be janky. All right, so we'll draw our line back on here. And now let's run it again. So we have a little bit more density in our topology, the number. So that should give us a little bit more resolution to capture some of the form. And we're using polygroups and we're using actual form changes that we sculpted in to give us a more predictable result, hopefully. Before we run it though, we need to make sure that we're gonna tell Z Remesh to use our groups. So we're gonna click keep groups. And you can see smooth groups is a parameter that comes up online. So by default, smooth groups is set to one. So it's actually going to keep in mind those groups, but then kind of like smooth them together. So you might lose some of the shape, but we'll keep it at one and see what we get before we tweak it. So I'll hit Z remesh and see what we get. All right, so now let's go up. So now let's take a look. So you can see a little bit better than we had before. We actually have a loop that goes all the way around. And we look over here at this eye, it's like totally messed up. You can see at least we're getting a circle around the eye, but there's still some problem areas. So let's try adding even more polygroups and reinforcing some more of these form edges to see if we can get an even better quality. So first we'll reinforce the eye topology and then we wanna do the nose and the mouth. And then we'll slice it along the inner lip line. It should get it already, honestly, but this could help really ensure, there we go. All right, now we're cooking. Now we'll hit it and see if we get a mesh that is a lot closer to what we want in the end. All right, there we go. So this has outlined the features better than it did before. See, like not perfect for sure. Sometimes I would come in here and just clean stuff up. Like I can just go to the Z modeler brush, kind of delete this guy and then weld this to here, that kind of stuff. But in general, you can see the part that we didn't do on the eye is pretty messed up but this is outlining the features and it's still super low, right? So that's what we want and that's why we took the time to do these extra steps in doing polygroups and reinforcing some of those forms because now we can combine this with the first tip and I can divide this up, bump, bump, bump. I can come over to my palette. I'll turn everything off except our original. So now we'll project, not at the full res. Right now I'll do project on three, project all, doink. And I'll go up a couple times, make sure the topology is not too pinched. Okay, so we're almost there. Let's let's divide one more time and we'll do one more project. And this one's probably gonna take a while because it's a heavier mesh. You can see at the top, it's thinking a lot more than it did before. But that's how we're gonna capture all the detail we had in our original sculpt, that original shape. Okay, so here we are projected. Let's zoom in here, okay? And we'll jump over to the original. Here's the original mesh, that's DynaMesh. You can see the topology, all the little, you know, janky triangles and stuff. Now, we'll pop over to the new one. Can't even really see a difference other than these little things moving. Boy, we actually have more res. And now look at our topology. 
If I group everything as one color, you can see the flow now. We can drop all the way down and look at that. Now we have this nice mesh. We can make big movements on. If we divide all the way back up, it looks exactly how we had before. So this is really the power of combining the things like Z Remesher and Polygroups together to make finished models after the fact. And then we use projection to project the model we made initially onto there so it looks exactly the same, but now we have way more control. We can go up and down. We can finish the surface and make something really smooth. And also we can do things like UV map this, export it to another program. We could use textures, displacement maps to do a nice clean finished model. And it's really a joy to work with something like this. And it just took us a few minutes to do. All right, my last little pro tip here is about reference images and using them in ZBrush. Over the years, I've tried a lot of different ways of bringing in reference pictures so I can trace on them and then save cameras and views and stuff so that I can come back to the project later and continue where I've left off without everything messing up. So I'm gonna show you the best way that I know how to do it right now. So say I wanna bring in a reference image. I'll come over here to draw, come over here and I'll go to load image. Click that and I'll click open and doink. Now I have a reference image. So I can't really see through my model yet. So I'll go to draw and I'll go to model opacity and let's go down here, doink. You can see also that the shadow is still on there. I think there's some kind of multiply mode. So actually if I go to the light and I boost the ambient, it'll actually make him a little bit easier to see through. All right, now let's position this guy. First of all, I wanna keep in mind the kind of lens that maybe was used for this source reference image. Is it super kind of flat or is it very distorted? We wanna go on one of those ends, right? So this looks like a portrait, maybe at a distance. Typically, if it's something that's meant to be a portrait, it's a longer lens. So we'll go to draw. You can see 85 is set. That's a good length. Maybe 100, because it's a little more flat. It doesn't have to be super perfect. We just want to make sure we're in that neighborhood. Is it wide or is it long? Okay, and then we'll come over here and start positioning our guy. There we go. We lined up our model to the reference image so that we can start moving things around, right? We can just say like, okay, this needs to go more to the eye like this, right? This eye comes down a little bit like this. His nose a little bigger, you know, that kind of thing. His mouth is down here, that kind of stuff, right? Cool. Now I need to save this so that I can keep working on it, right? So if we go over to draw, we can go to store camera and then I can store the reference image. Doink, cool, background image stored. So now if I go file, save as, and I save this project, it'll save all my cameras with my images. So you go, now it's saved, so now I can quit ZBrush. Then when I open it later, if I open the project, everything will be just how I had it. So one of the cool things about this is if I come over here to draw, you can see here's this cool button. This toggles the opacity so that I can flip back and forth between seeing the reference image and seeing my model. So I could just easily hotkey this if I come over here, hold control and alt, click this, and then go shift Q. Now I've got shift Q flips back and forth. Check that out. Now I can do over here and go, oh, you know what? His nose is a little bit like, got his nice eyeball like this. Cool. Then I go, ah, yeah, looking good, looking good, right? I can also do this with multiple cameras and then I can even flip through them so I can jump around so that I'm working on the different angles because you always want to work on different angles when you're working on a face likeness like this because if you work on it too long in one angle, it's going to start to look flat and weird. So we need to be jumping around. So if I come over here, you can see I've got toggles between the cameras I've already saved. So if I make this a hotkey, then I can toggle between my different angles, each with their own reference image. Isn't that cool? And I can always toggle this on and off. Come in here and I can say, you know what? I need, I need to like see way through this. There we go. Yeah. And then move this around. And we go, this goes like this. Yes. I like this, you know. And there you go. So this makes it really easy to jump around in the different reference images, toggle between the transparency and really help you dial in your likeness. If you're just getting started with ZBrush, I suggest checking out my video on using Dynamesh the right way. And if you want to brush up on some sculpting fundamentals, check out my video on form hierarchy. Thank you for watching. Peace out.